welcome to the Hindu analysis for 3rd of October 2018. So these are the important news items to what has been picked up from the Hindu newspaper. Let's look them in detail. The first one, the farmers rally to capital turns violent. So here there is an order which has been issued under the section 144 where it has been issued and 3000 police personnel have actually been deployed. So with respect to the strikes and also to what the farmers are doing in reaching with the Delhi capital. So here the police had actually fired the water cannon and also the tear gas shells. This is to disperse the thousands of the farmers where who are actually affiliated to the Bharatiya Kisan Union. They call it as BKU. So this is one of it and this is why they even uh, dispersed the fire of the water cannon and also tear gas because they are the people they started breaking the barricades to enter the national capital. So this was actually they went on for a you know rally or kind of an uh, kind of a deployment of the people into a yatra on September 23rd. So this was uh, actually they were preventing not to allow them into the Delhi state. So this was one important aspect on so account of it section 144 was being used on. So that's the reason the farmers they are moving on the mass or a yatra to what they began. It became as a violent issue. And apart from that as they were uh, using the tractors and also the barricades to enter there the police and several other people were injured in return and this was uh, where the people in sense the um, ministers they started convincing the farmers to return and the government would give to what they would actually looking out for but the people were not happy with what the promises the government was been making and here the minister of the state for agriculture he met the protesters and he assured that all the demands would be taken into consideration do you BKU chief was not happy about it and he said the farmers are not satisfied with what the government is giving as an assurance. So this is about it and we will see what is assurance the government gave. So here it is with respect to the center would consider reducing the GST on farm equipment to 5% but here the demand of the farmers is that they wanted to exempt it completely not to have any kind of a GST attractions on the farm equipment but right now it is 5% are telling that make it as an exemptions. And apart from that the center was also making all with support to increase up with the higher minimum support prices but in anyway uh, the pro uh, farmers were not happy with this particular aspect and they wanted something else more better and they also were discussing more on the issues of such as loan waivers as well and they were also talking about the economically unviable which means that c2 plus fl formula which is not been economically so we have so this one important aspects in the earlier videos we have spoken about c2 plus fl so you can just look on to it and apart from that there was also the center which agreed for a legal review petition which is on to the ngt that's national green tribunal so it is trying to ban all the diesel vehicles for more than 10 years which is older than ncr so this particular aspects which would be affecting the government as well as what is being brought the board of it and they're also we're talking about the tractors can't be counted as a vehicle so that would not come under the concept called as vehicle this was one of the statements which has been coming from mr shekawat the minister and they were also trying to set a committee to resolve the implementation of all the problems on to the crops insurance and also the farmer credit schemes review the possibility of including the crop damage by the wild animals and also should set them under the insurance sector. So this is one important and they were also telling that the farmers representative should be included in the Niti Aayog special committee so that they will be able to focus on linking the agriculture with MG Nareka and also they agreed to ensure that the crops were produced at the MSP rates within 90 days. It should not be more than that the MSP rates they have to be produced within 90 days and here the farmers they also recommended and since they demanded for the MS Swaminathan committee to be accepted by the government. So as of now the government is not completely accepted onto MS Swaminathan committee. The farmers are saying you have to accept with the MS Swaminathan committee. So this is about it and this reason the Yatra had happened and in the Yatra they wanted to enter the Delhi and that had become a problem right now. So right now it is a, a violent which has been happening. So this particular Yatra to what they have taken has become a thing. It's a, actually the Kisan Kranti Yatra. So this is about it and the next one. Mindset change has fueled such success. This is Modi who is making a presentation on it. So he tells that the people's participation which is combined with the public funding and also the partnerships. So this is actually the key drivers in the Swachh Bharat Abhyan which was successful campaign against the open defecation. So this was actually addressing the International Sanitation Convention on the 4th anniversary cleanliness mission and India has been taking a lead on the UN Sustainable Development Goal. 
so it will be able to complete the course of even before the commitment periods of 11 years earlier so here to the mission to what we have taken there is also a thing under the sanitation of the sustainable development goals so here they're doing a kind of a comparison to even before by 2030 we'll be able to attain to what is called as a swach bharat abhiyan so India has shown that with the political will and also the commitment. So this was one of the statements which has been coming from the UN General Secretary, Antonio. So he is a person who said that it was possible with respect to the political will on the commitment and it is also possible to achieve the ambitious targets very quickly. So this is one of it and he was also citing the Swachh Bharat Amyan as an example for the global community in return. So this was an exchange of talks to what had happened on the Swachh Bharat Amyan. So this is about it. The next one, protest mounts against Supreme Court verdict. So we know that uh, right now the Sabrimala temple is being open even for the women. So it means that the ban has been taken out. But here the Hindu organizations, they held the marches and also the dharnas in different parts of Kerala. This is to express the dismay to what the Supreme Court has given a verdict. People are not happy about it as they allow the women to get into the temples. So this was one of the important aspects and the biggest turnout was on Pandalam. So it was where the hundreds of... Uh, Ayapa devotees they have been in I mean they formed a large mass there and there were also women also who had been taken part of this particular fight so they were completely not happy to what the uh, you know the verdict what the Supreme Court has given in return so this was a united fight from a common up political platform against the move to destroy the age-old customs and also the traditions at Sabrimala so the verdict what has been coming they're saying that this is actually destroying their customs and also the traditions to what they are following in Sabrimala. So this is about it. Understand that people are not going good with the verdict to what has been coming from the Supreme Court. How is the challenges being faced by the courts and how are the people taking up with the different verdicts when the, whenever the Supreme Court makes up anything on a humanity, morality and also the dignity of the person in return. So this is about it. And the next one, the government gives into some demands but from us adamant. So as we saw in the first part, the same thing which has been discussed here since we are already done. I am skipping that. The next one, Venkaya Naidu inaugurates World Peace Monument. So here the Vice President of India has actually inaugurated the world's largest doom at Maharashtra Institute of Technology. So this is actually the campus at Loni Kalbor on the commemoration of or the anniversary of 150th birth anniversary of Mr. Mahatma Gandhi. On commemoration of that, the Vice President has inaugurated the first, I'm sorry, the world's largest doom. So here the institute said that the culture was structure was called as the world peace monument dome so it has taken all almost nearly 13 years to build this particular dome and they also compared it with saint peter's basilica basilica which is in the vatican city so there's a present dome to what has been constructed and this is a saint peter's basilica in vatican city so if you see the diameter of to the present structure it is 160 feet in diameter and it is 260 feet tall but in terms this is in terms of area wise so it has a larger area when compared to this part so we are standing in first position but when we talk about the comparison with the st peter's basilican so it is uh, 136 against 160 to what we have constructed and the feet height is 448 feet wherein this is 230 263 feet so they are larger in area comparatively when compared to these two things so this uh, dome is actually built on the mit that's maharashtra institute of technology world peace library and also the world peace play hall which has been named after the 13th century poet is a saint and also a philosopher dhyaneshwar so on the name of this person is what the place has been held up the peace library and also the prayer and about that we have this particular doom so it's actually a pivotal figure of the bhakti movement in maharashtra so there's one important aspects and each of the massive columns of the doom which is standing tall to be at 63 feet the prayer hall can be accommodated with almost 3,500 people and this is one of the most uh, you know, accomplished and portrait one and 50 accomplished men are being globally embellished with this particular aspects. So this is about it. Just know like comparatively what is the other place which has been taken into consideration. This is St. Peter's and this is with respect to the to, that's a world peace monument. The next one, in a first 10 Odisha villages eradicate untouchability. So it's actually a month long effort which was been put by the social organization Jagruti and Antaranga. So here the people they started moving on for villages talking about the untouchability on the tribute to Mahatma Gandhi. So here the 10 villages in seven panchayats in 
Dharingabad Badi block of Odisha's Kandalmal district, they have declared that the habitants untouchability free. So there's one of the important aspects which has been part of your fundamental rights, part three of the constitution, which deals with the article 17. So that's abolition of untouchability. Though the constitution has given a way for abolition of untouchability, but still most of the villages and the places, they still had a practices of untouchability. But again, it was not being abolished completely from the system. There were new kinds of forms which were still being practiced. So now the organizations have come forward to educate the people to what is untouchability, why are they practicing, doesn't have a sense and all the other things. Where the seven villages and seven panchayats, they have actually agreed and they have said that the habitants are untouchable free hereafter. They will not be practicing the untouchability. So there's one important aspect which has to be noted into considerations. So this was actually a path breaking decision. So which has been in villages and this was completely inhabited by the tribes and also the scheduled caste. So this might be also going from the society bit by bit. So there's one step of success. But again, we have few more things, few more villages which would be uh, declaring themselves to be as an untouchable free. So this is about it. And the next one, 88 million year old ISIL and crater to be as a geoparks. So this with respect to the first ancient circular lake which is, was created by the meteorite strike in Maharashtra. And apart from that, we also have another one, hexagonal mosaic of ballistic rocks. So it is an island of the Udipi, uh, actually poised to become as a global geopark. So which is under the Geological Survey of India. So these are the two important ones, which has been under the geoparks candidates right now. That's ancient circular lake. And second one is the mosaic of the ballistic rock. So here this one, the lake which is called as in Lonar Lake which is in Maharashtra and St. Pete Mary's Island and Malpi Beach in coastal Karnataka are GSI candidates for the UNESCO's Global Geopark Network status. So here they are actually, their geopark is nothing but akin of that of the World Heritage Site for all the historical monuments that can bring India's uh, famed geological features to the global stage. So here the Lonar Lake is the only known meteorite crater in the ballistic rock and is world famous as well wherein St. Mary's Highland is a unique phenomenon that has been preserved from a very long time. So these were the two important criteria as to why they have chosen it to be as a part of it. And St. Mary's Highland which was being declared as a national geo heritage site in 1975 and this is to be estimated as an 88 million year old formation and it actually goes back to the great India which was at the time when it got broke from the Madagascar. So they are dating back there and uh, the Lonar crater which became a geo heritage site in 17, I'm sorry, 1979. So this is relatively young geologically at just 50,000 years old. So this is like very younger when compared to other geological formations and this is just 50,000 years old when compared to the other parts. So these are the two important candidates who has been listed under the geopark status. So that's about it. And the next one, toilets for all. WHO calls for more investments. So here we are basically talking with respect to the toileting structure which is about the sanitation which is a very important goal of the sustainable development goals. So here you have these 17 goals to what it has to be considered of. So this is about it. So actually it has been repeated. So till here is what you have it. So this is one important repetition. So here the world will not reach the goal of the universal sanitation coverage. So where every person in the world they have to have an access to toilets by 2030. So this is what the main goal of the sustainable development. But this would not be possible unless the country, com that's the countries, they don't have a comprehensive policy shifts and they have to invest more in funds. This is one of the important aspects to what the WHO has been given. And for the first time, the WHO has also been announced for the global guidelines on sanitation and health because we have to achieve the sanitation. If that is not been there, which means that most of the issues would not be sorted at the earliest. So in a release, the organization was adopting the WHO's new guidelines but the countries definitely they will have a manifestation to reduce the diarrheal deaths which is due to the unsafe water, sanitation and hygiene. So these are the main areas to why the diarrheal deaths are happening. So if you work on this, the deaths would be completely reduced and there should be for every US $1 invested in sanitation. So they are saying that WHO estimates a nearly six-fold return as measured by the lower health cost increased productivity and also fewer premature deaths. 
So at least for dollar one invested in sanitation, these are the outcomes, which means that they would be having fewer premature deaths. There would be a high increased productivity and a lower health cost as well. And worldwide, if you have to compare the sanitation structure, 2.3 billion people are lacking even for the basic sanitations. And there are 4.5 billion uh, who are not even having access for the uh, you know, kind of in safely managed sanitation services, which means that the toilets are not been connected to the sewage or for a pit septic tanks where it has to move on for a water waste water treatment. So this is not being done. So 4.5 billion people are not being in sent the sewages or not been connected to the treatment of waste water. So this is one important aspect. And they were also talking about without a proper access to the people, if the access for the toilets, which means that they have been deprived of dignity, safety, and also convenience of a decent toilet. So there's one important thing which has to be taken into consideration. And here the World Health Organization sanitation and the health guidelines are essential to securing the health and well-being for everyone and everywhere. So this is where uh, they're trying to focus more in terms of the guidelines and what would be the impact and the positivity of the guidelines in Britain. But what are the causes and effect? So here this uh, WHO which developed this new guidelines on sanitation and health because the current sanitation programs are not achieving the anticipated health gains to what we have to get. There's a lack of authoritative health based guidance on the sanitation and there's no proper policy which would be implemented for the same. So there's one of the important aspects to why we have the guidelines right now. Secondly, here billions of people are not even able to access even for the minimum and the basic sanitation services. Since that has been lacking another area why the WHO has came up with the first global guidelines and poor sanitation is definitely a major factor for the transmission of the neglected tropical diseases. So the diseases might also be in a larger extent if the sanitation is not been maintained in an economy which means that we need to invest more on the health cost. So this is also another area to why they wanted to stop it off. So this is about it. So on total now the guidelines has been issued by the WHO or the health sanitation that's the main thing. The next one, the rape survivors can't subvert trial. So this is with respect to the judgment which has been coming from the Supreme Court after the several kind of an hostile cases which has been turning to be in terms of a rape cases. So here there was one particular case which was dealt by the rape, rape which was been committed to a nine year old kid in Gujarat in the year 2004. But this particular case actually been registered six months after the incident had actually occurred. So here the child has turned hostile during the trial when the trial had happened the child was completely hostile and she disposed that after the injuries to what had happened was during to the fall to what she had had. So there's nothing related to rape she fell and that's when the bruises and the injuries had happened. So this was the statement was being coming from the child. So here they're also we're talking about the medical reports and the physical examination of her clothes have proved to be it as a rape. But this was uh, something where the child has not been told and not only this particular child but it is an age old problem of the rape victims who are turning to be an hostile. And this is one of the reasons why where most of the cases are becoming an acquittal instead of a conviction. So neither the accused nor the victim can be permitted to subvert a criminal trial by stating a falsehood, resort to contrivances or it make it a traitor of absurd. So here to what has been called as a rape just because they have been getting hostile, it's become a convital and this is giving a room for absurd, something unreasonable and illogical. So this is what the Supreme Court is seeing plenty of cases in terms of the rape survivors and they also said that now this girl who has been was a nine year old rape victim. So now the court has actually forgiven her as she's been married right now and this was a life of testimony and the court has pardoned her because she has moved on with her life. There's no point in getting her under the clutches right now. So year after it tells that the turning hostile of a rape survivor should not deter a court from continuing with the trial. So even if you are turning to be an hostile, it should not deter to what the court con continues to be it as a trial. So here they're telling that once uh, the victim that is uh, neither the accused nor the victim of the sexual assault can make a criminal trial once the wheels have turned on into a theater of absurd that is with respect to the illogical or unreasonable the supreme court held in a judgment so hereafter there won't be any detriment in continuing the trial if it is a case of rape survival so this is about it and the next one support dhaka and rohingya crisis so your India must support the Bangladesh in dealing with the Rohingya crisis and put more pressure on the Myanmar. 
So this was one of the instance, the statement which has been coming from the United Nations Secretary, Mr. Antonio Guterres. So he was the one who was making more kind of an involvement of India towards the Rohingya issues to, to be one of the big, big roller where he can definitely get a changes as he's been called as a fundamental pillar of multilateralism. So this was one important aspect to what Mr. Antonio, he made it a statement. And here where he was also talking about um, the problems of nearly millions of refugees who fled violence to live in camps in the Cox bazaars in Bangladesh. So these are the people who have been uh, flewed from Myanmar and they have been completely unacceptable in any either of the countries. So here he was also talking about the time when he had moved on with the World Bank chief to look on to the places and the camps of the Cox bazaars. So they actually warned that the terror groups were actually recruiting the people from the Rohingya refugees. But they're saying that luckily there were no much of the people who have been recruited for the terrorist organisms, organizations. That was one of the important uh, aspects which was on a positive note. If suppose, if they have been taken or recruited in a larger extent, then terrorist groups would have been become more expandable. So this was one of the caution to what it has been given. And, a pro, and apart from that, uh, they were also talking about um, India's role in a new multilateral architecture where it is trying to counter the terrorism in all aspects. So there are several uh, committees and organizations even like India has been pushing up to have the counter-terrorism and they were talking about the multilateral struct architecture to what India has been looking and countering. But they were also talking about uh, the world is not accepted or still it's not ready to accept to be India as a permanent seat in the United Nations, the Security Council. So this was like his own grief to what he was talking. Though India has been eligible, though India has been trying to do from all the spears to what it can do, but still India's appeal for a permanent seat has not been accepted. It's still far to reach on. There's one important aspect. And he also sidelinely, he started criticizing the US, which actually broke the commitment in the UN conventions on climate change, where India has still been a part of it, and also the renewable energy efforts. So this is one of the important aspects. And it was also the ISA meeting was also held up here because for the f he, was, he was here to attend the first assembly of the International Solar Alliance. And also they were uh, looking out for the conference of the energy ministers of the Indian Ocean Rim Association countries. So uh, apart from that, it was a long celebration to what they had actually planned to celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. And October 2nd on a sideline was also declared to be as an international day of non-violence. That's non-violence by the United Nations in the year back in 2007. So he also respected Mr. Gandhi on to the Rajgarh to where he's been cremated. And he was also talking about Gandhi should be as a greatest soul that has ever lived and our guide in our troubled world. So he was a greatest soul and he was also a guide in more in our country which is called as a troubled world so this was something about he made it as a statement he wrote it on the crematoria so this is about it so basically this is like looking out for more support from india in terms of dhaka's that bangladesh where the people are more settled in that particular area so that's a rohingyas from the rakhine province the next one the bangladesh delays relocation of rohingyas so here the, actually the Bangladesh has delayed a planned relocation of a part of the Rohingya refugees from Myanmar to an islet in the Bay of Bengal. So here the Bangladesh Navy has been building a facility to house the population that have actually been displaced from the Rohik, Rakhine province of Myanmar which is following a violent campaign by the military, that's a country's military. So they're, what they're saying is that camp major part has been ready, just a 30% of the work which has been remaining. So once it's been done, the relocation of the people would happen there. But here again, they're saying that this particular area is actually a crowded area, first thing. And here they also found that this particular people, they have to be um, moving on to the camps before the monsoon season. But now it's been a long time still, they've not been moved on to the safe journey. They are still into the overcrowded camp of Bangladesh and Myanmar border. Still, they are there in the same places. Still, it's not been completed or area has not been given. But apart from that, they are also saying that the facility to what the Bangladesh is doing for the Rakhine, that's the Rohingyas, that's the Bashan Char, is actually been criticized by the human rights groups as it has been a flood prone and an hazardous area. So this location is something where uh, the human rights uh, group have not been accepted and they always also have where it is a host of the powerful storms as well, where every year it happens with a pre-monsoon season. So which means that again, it's 
uh, people out there might not be safety in terms of the storms and also the other flood prone and the hazardous situations and the leaders from the rohingya communities were also not happy about the relocation of the government because this particular area to what they call it as a bashan shar facility which is cut off from the mainland so if they want any emergency medical attention to where would the people go and get that attention is something where the community leaders are making up with their talks so even the people overall they even not happy with whatever the facility has been happened because those facilities are in the areas where it's still a disasterful area and not a complete safety has been given to the rohingyas people so this is about it and the next news item india sends relief materials to indonesia so here we have the indian air force and the navy have actually launched an effort to deliver the relief material to the tsunami hit indonesia we know that the indonesia has been hit by tsunami in the palu that is the area to where it has been done so now the india is also helping out to send all the relief feature materials from the indian air force and also from the through the navy so here the navy has actually diverted the ship ins thir sujata and shardul for the deployment of uh, to singapore to palu in indonesia and i have that air force has deployed c 130 j and c 17 transport aircraft to ferry the medical teams and also the relief materials along with them so sometimes upsc will also ask you also how would you move from india to indonesia what are the routes that you would be taking to reach the palu place so here you have to know from chennai the aircraft have to fly to kulanamau international airport and from there it has to reach to palu so this is something where they last for the routes as well so just be cautious on about it so those about what they sent what which carrier is taking is not important but rather which route it's going becomes an important aspects so just know this about it and the next one the laser pointers win the physics nobel so the year the three scientists are actually won the nobel physics prize which is having an inclusion of one woman from the last 55 years which has been actually receiving an award now this is for inventing the optical lasers that have paved the way for advanced precision instruments which is used in correcting the high surgery so now here they are come up with a new advanced precision instruments which can be used for correcting the high surgery this is the no, inventing of optical lasers so the first person is mr ashkin who is 96 year old and your his invention is on optical tubers tweezers that uh, actually grabs the particles atoms and viruses and other living cells with their laser beam fingers so with this he has been able to use the radiation pressure of light to move the physical objects so this was one of the old dream of the science fiction itself so this has been coming through and apart from that the oldest nobel winners apart from that we have is mr morau 74 and the strickland 59 so the, she was a one among the third lady in sense so uh, as of now it's only three women who have been selected and she is a third woman to win the physics that's a prize one for helping a uh, develop a method to generate the ultra short optical pulses so this is the <coughs> sorry this is the shortest and most intense laser pulses ever created by the mankind so they take the contribution of this and these techniques are actually been used in corrective high surgeries so your mr morrow has actually involved in building the extreme light infrastructure that is eli project that is actually to be believed one of the world's most powerful lasers so it's called as in the apollon which is used in the developments researches which will hope to be one of the most important deal with the nuclear waste treating the tumors and also clearing the debris in space so this is where the apollon may be used in the near future and strickland said she was actually been thrilled to receive the nobel prize because she was uh, one of the women who will be receiving the awards and she is a third of third such women who is receiving the award in return so this is about it and here you have the tools made using the light so here you have the complete structure to how it works and these are the three important people to what they would be making their structures so this is about it you can just look on to them when you're free the next one il and fs investors await the board road maps so your your the all eyes are been just waiting for the first board meeting of the infra infrastructure leasing and financial services as the shareholders they would be making a decision to what has to be called to be taken as a rights issue after the board deliberations so your this uh, once a new board if it comes into the picture then they would start addressing on the liquidity as well as the raise your uh, resources to tide over the cash crunch 
So these are the two important things to what would the new board would be looking on to it. So this board meeting has actually been scheduled to October 8. So now Uday Kotak who has been appointed as a non-executive chairman of the board uh, which has members from the bureaucracy and also the industry. So those are the people who have been talking about the IL and FS services and they are just waiting for a good outcomes to come on. And apart from that you should know who are the contributors, the larger shareholders for ILFS that is LIC, SBI and HDFC which has also been uh, talking about it is showing a positive stand when it comes to what the move has been taken right now the new board will be able to uh, sort the issue of liquidity and also the crash crunch so the largest shareholder is S that is LIC with 25.34 stake percent and SPI is with respect to 6.42 stake and the other one is HDFC which is almost with 9.02 stake in the company so these are the ch largest shareholders of ILN FS they're just waiting for the October 8th meeting to what is the best outcome and what is the new chairman going to take up with the call so that's about it and the next one Tata Sky takes 22 Sony Pictures Network channels off air so here we have the 22 channels of the Sony Pic Pictures Network India of channels have been dropped from the Tata Sky network owing for the disagreement over the revenue sharing between the broadcasters and also the carrier. So here the broadcaster and the carrier they have a disagreement over the revenue sharing between two what has to be telecaster and all other areas which has been there. So now this 22 channels of the Sony Pictures network has been dropped from the Tata Sky network. So this was uh, insisting on the certain payment terms. So here the Tata Sky was actually not willing to pay that much which will actually lead to the situation where it is not to be happening on. So this is what the Tata Sky is trying to justify. And here we have um, the tri regulations. According to the tri regulations, the Tata Sky on its own has identified the 11 SPN channels. So other than the 22 disband that the beamed so that the customers can view for the popular channels. To get this beamed, here the customers they have to give a missed call for the activation of these 11 channels then as per the requirement the channels would be telecasted. So India Today TV is also one of the channels which is among the 22 dropped by the Tata Sky. So based on the activation of the identified channels that as Tata Sky will start making the payment to the broadcasters. So here they were also talking about the commercial negotiation with the broadcasters which actually broke down as they were seeking would have forced for a high price hike. So there would be a if this would have done then definitely there would be a hike or prices so they are actually requesting the subscribers to bear with them as they are doing for the interest of the subscribers itself so there is something looking out for the betterment of the people as the subscribers so by giving them into a individuals missed call numbers for each of the channels that is Tata Sky would set up and ensure that the channel has been broadcasted so here the SPN in return to the reply is giving that it is unfortunate that the Tata Sky has unilaterally chosen to drop the 22 SPN channels. So even though they have not made any kind of um, statements of increasing the rate of its channels. So this is what uh, SPN had to tell on the issue of dropping the 22 disbanded channels. So that was about it. So Sony channels that can be viewed on Tata Sky are these many. So these are the parts. So Ajdag, Sony Pix HD, Sony 10. Then uh, we have the HD 111 and Sony 6, Sony Max, Set HD, Sony SAP and SAT. So these are the ones. And the next one, world should move towards a single grid to share electricity, says Modi. So here we are talking about the International Solar Alliance. That's a foundation conference which we held in 2018. So here the Mr. Prime Minister Modi, he urged the world leaders to move towards the future, which is looking out for one world, one sun and one grid. So here the countries all around the world should share the electricity so that none is without it. So he wants that all the countries to be a part of this ISA and now he has been addressing with almost 70-40 countries which has been attending the inauguration for the first general assembly of the ISA. So Mr. Modi said that the chairman of the alliance so far restricted the countries only between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. So they were confined to the countries between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn and this would be expanded to include all other countries who have been part of the United Nations. So it's been like last 150 to 200 years the human have used all the fuels which has been available on the ground for the lighting to what they require but now it's a time where the nature is protesting in return and now they're saying that is a continuous message to what it has been given forward that fuels should be found above the ground as well. It's looking out for a betterment and 
the alternation of it. So they were also talking about the Paris Agreement of 2015, where they wanted to have the commitments of the country and not enough to halt. So to whatever the commitments is done back in 2015, it's not been sufficient to reduce the warming at 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius as the human are making it warmer faster than what it has to be as a reduction part. So we're also talking about the Paris 2015. And this International Solar Alliance was actually launched in 2015 and the headquarters is in India. So remember that the ISA headquarters is in India. So far, some three countries have signed for the framework agreement, but 44 have been ratified it. So this is about it. And we're also talking about the ISA has become a new ray of hope where um, just in three years and we're also talking about it would become one of the top list of the climate change organizations of the 21st century. 21st century it becomes a success story but even in three years there's a lot of uh, you know results which can be seen and uh, the OPEC was doing for the world but here after the future ISA will also do and the role of the oil wells will be replaced with the sun's rays so hereafter we don't have to look on for the oil wells or the grounds or the fuels and other things it can be purely been replaced by the sun rays and your sign line you can also address with the climate change in return so regarding any that the prime minister also said that the country has set a target of 40 percent of electricity generation capacity from non-fossil fuels by 2030 so this is the commitment to what india has made to as a target they wanted to 40 percent of electricity generation that would be coming from the non-fuel basis from by 2030. So far 20% of the capacity is from the non-hydro renewables. So they are saying that 20% has been taken from the non-hydro renewables so far. So there is another 20% to what we have to watch you on. So this is about it. And the next one, steel construction attract rating push. So here we are talking about the proportion of upgrades and also to the downgrades that is a credit ratio which has been given by the rating agency Crystal, which has stood to be at 1.68 in the first half of the fiscal year 2019 when compared with 1.88 times and 1.45 times in the first and the second halves of the fiscal year 2018 respectively. So here there have always been an upgrade and downgrade as well. The upgrade is for 685 and downgrades is 408 in the first fiscal of the 2019. And this for the first time in five years, the credit ratio for the investment linked sectors. So we're talking about the credit ratio for investment linked sectors at 2.15 times is higher than the overall credit ratio. So this was the statement which was been coming from Crystal. And upstick would be seen in sectors such as steel, constructions and the industry machinery that actually benefited not only from the beyond community prices, but also that the government's infrastructure spending, which has aimed in lag in the private investments in return. So this is about it. And for the domestic consumption linked sectors, we spoke about the investment linked sectors, this consumption linked sectors, where the demand growth drivers remain strong. But rising interest rates could act as a mild dampener, and the export linked sectors have also been as a strong growth, growth revival in recent months, which has backed in the global economy and a sliding rupee. So on the export linked sectors, the problem is on the sliding rupee and the global economy. Consumption linked sector is with doing good, but just with the rising interest rates, which is actually becoming a dampener in return, a mild dampener. So these were the three, three important sectors which was being discussed. And apart from that, they were also talking about uh, not everything was going good in India. There are a lot many things uh, which has been faced by the rupee depreciation. Then we have the rising interest rates and risk, ri I'm sorry, rising risk of the global tariffs disputes, which is turning into a flow blown trade wars. This was completely being cautioned by Crystal that this has to be looked at the earliest and the Crystal analyst of about 2,500 firms in the portfolio that have uh, foreign currency exposures shows that the impact of the recent rupee volatility on profitability will be at the modest level. So the top 10 sectors with a high foreign currency exposures, which are been including with the gas, oil, power and telecom will see a net profit margin which would be eroding the fiscal by up to 150 basis points. So we also have the ICRA, this is another rating agency actions. This first fiscal point to increase the downward rating pressure on the investment grade entities. So here the main fiscal point is to increase the downward rating of the pressures on investment trade entities. This is reflected into the rating drift of the investment grade entities which has been turning negative in the first half of the financial year 2019 for the first time this is since financial year 14. So this was one of as well as the rise in the rate of the 
downgrades as well. So here the comparison is between the financial year 19 to what has been getting to term into negative aspects when compared to uh, financial year 14. Since then, this for the first time, this is what the negative aspect would what be saying on. So this is about it. And here the rating drift of the investment trade entities, entities have actually deteriorated to negative to be as 1.1 percentage in the first half of the financial year 19 compared to the 3.2 percentage of the financial year 2018 and this against the five year average to what to be used as 4.3 percentage. So negative 5.1 and the average is supposed to be like 4.3 percentage. So this was a statement coming from another credit agency ICRA while the overall pace of the downward rating drift of the rating in the first half of the financial year which has been remained similar to that of the financial year 18. So the, again the downward, uh, downward rating drift which is there is a condition of it and the credit quality pressures on the investment trade entities which has been actually been intensified. So this was a statement which was first coming from the chief rating officer from ICRA. So you should know that the origin of the concept of this credit rating, why is this and what is this? So this concept was actually been originated in USA in the year 1909. So here the founder was actually the Moody's Investor Service and we also have the John Moody which rated the US railroad bonds and here it is relevance for the concept where they have to realize only after the great depression. So this concept they realized only after the great depression when the investors lost all their money. So when they lost all their money they felt that there should be a credit agency which actually makes an assessment of it and gives them in terms to what they have to get as a cautioning part. This was a lack of asymmetric information and a high cost of collecting information which actually increased the popularity of the credit rating agencies. So now the world's biggest rating agency is a Moody's investor service and the second one is the Standard & Poor's. So these are the two important biggest rating agencies but in India we have a three important agencies. So one is CRISL which stands for Credit Rating and Information Services of India Limited. This was what we spoke so far and ICRA that Investment Information and Credit Rating Agency of India. This is also we spoke about it and Care Ratings there is another one where it is called as in Credit Analysis and Research Limited. So these are the important agencies which rates on the credit part. So Prizel is actually the market leader in credit rating industry with 70% of the market shares. So these are the three important credit agencies in India and these are the credit part rating to what we have got in written. So you can just look on to them in detail. That's about it. Just go through them. You will understand more better. And the question for the day, you have to brief on ISA, that's International Solar Islands Alliance, sorry. And secondly, you have to brief on Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. So these were the two important things to what has been coming in the news very repeatedly. So you can just look on to this. So that's it. So these were the important news items for 3rd 10 2018. Thank you.